Okay, so we've uh, been looking at phonological distributions and what kinds of rules and constraints those uh, <coughs> apply to those different distributions and also how we think they're represented or not represented in the lexicon, and that's based on considerations of uh, phonological predictability um, or non-predictability. Uh, and actually, all of the hard stuff about distributions we've mostly gone through already. So there's the fully predictable um, and never changing features. Those are basically uh, constraints on the inventory of a language. We have uh, distributions that um, are not contextually constant, that change by context, and those can either be partially predictable, uh, that was the case of positional neutralization that we saw with, for instance, the tense lax feature in English, or labial continuance and non-continuance in Maori. Um, and then we can also have uh, the type of distribution that varies by context, but is fully predictable in every context. Right? And that would be the example of complementary distribution, or allophones, that we just saw uh, for English nasal, uh, nasal and oral vowels. There is one more kind of distribution here, although that was all the really tricky stuff. Um, we talked about features that are not contrastive and that they're the same in every environment, that are not contrastive but differ in different environments, and features that are contrastive in some environments but predictable in others. The last possibility here, at least for this class, uh, is features that are contrastive in all environments. Um, and we tend not to think of this as a distribution necessarily, because these are simply contrastive features in a language that don't neutralize. So for instance, in English, voicing is contrastive almost everywhere. There's an exception that we'll talk about later this semester, but for right now, uh, we're going to say that voicing is basically contrastive in any position where stops can occur or fricatives can occur in English. Um, so this is shown in the data on page four, uh, where we have voicing contrasts in just about every environment or context that you can think about. And these um, environments are stated in sort of uh, slightly schematic terms in the leftmost column here, where V stands for a vowel, and uh, the pound sign indicates a word boundary, um, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Um, there's actually a mistake in that table. You can find the mistake in the environments that I've drawn here. Uh, that would be a good exercise. Anyhow, uh, here's what we're seeing. Uh, minimal pairs in each of these contexts. At a word beginning before a vowel, pill versus bill. Uh, in between two vowels, rapid and rabid. Uh, following a vowel at the end of a word, lap and lab. Uh, before a l consonant, plush and blush. Uh, be, uh, following a plus nasal sound, here's the mistake. This is not at the end of a word. This is before um, another vowel. So simple and symbol, or ankle and angle. These are showing us that voicing is contrasted following a nasal before a vowel, um, and so on and so forth. We can find lots and lots of contexts in English where voicing is contrasted. And so the distribution of uh, the voicing feature, or the voicing contrast in English, is mostly unrestricted. That is, it's in free contrast, or you could guess you could call this a contrastive distribution. Um, although, because it doesn't really change, at least in these contexts, we wouldn't necessarily even think of it as a distribution. But what it means is that words in any one of these positions in English, excuse me, sounds in any one of these positions in English, are going to need to be specified for the plus or minus voice feature in the lexicon. Another way of putting that is if I give you uh, a context like uh, at the beginning of a word before the sequence ill, and I tell you, hey, there's a labial stop here. Is it voiced or voiceless? Uh, phonologically, you can't predict it. It could be either one. It would mean different things in the two cases. But there's no way to say that a labial stop here has to be voiced or has to be voiceless. Voicing is contrastive here, and so by hypothesis, that has to be in lexical entries. Um, voicing does not work this way in every language, and we're going to see that in detail later uh, this semester, although we've already seen this to some extent in Maori, where voicing is completely predictable from what manner of sound you are. 
Right? So for obstruents, voicing is always minus in melody. For sonorants and vowels, voicing is always plus.